On average, a full-grown Rottweiler consumes about 2-3% to of its body weight in food every single day. This can be anything from dog food to animal and marine protein, lean meats, the list goes on. But what if I told you that Rottweilers in Brazil unknowingly ate a person? Well, this alone is gruesome and vile, but the reason will give you genuine chills. I wish I could say that it wasn't real, but when 25-year-old Brazilian model, actress, and mother Eliza Samudio went missing, no one expected her remains to have been fed to Rottweilers, not even the police. Dubbed the invisible victim, since her remains can never be recovered, Eliza Samudio's case is going to leave you terrified, revolted, and in complete shock because it's the nightmarish depiction of the justice system siding with the famous and wealthy, judging the victim by their profession, and ultimately failing to protect them. Welcome to True Crime Stories. If you're new here, I post new true crime cases every single week with none of those terrible AI narrations, just you, me, and a case to solve. So if you want to see some good old-fashioned true crime documentaries, hit that subscribe button. It's totally free and it'll keep you up to date with all of my future videos. Eliza Silva Simudio was born on February 22, 1985 in Brazil to parents Louise and Fatima. Louise was an architect, whereas Fatima was a farmer. But the couple was anything but perfect. See, Louise was a violent man and would physically abuse Fatima on several occasions. It's safe to say that young Eliza got the very first glimpse of how terrible people can be very early on in her life. But Fatima wasn't the type of woman to stick around with an abusive man. So when Eliza was six months old, Fatima decided to take Eliza away from it all and divorce her husband. But since Fatima was in the throes of financial problems and couldn't raise a child on her own, Baby Eliza was left with Louise, while Fatima moved out of the family home and went on to restart her life in Campo Grande. Soon, she met a man, fell in love, got married, and the couple welcomed a son. The couple also started a somewhat successful pepper farm. All the while, Fatima occasionally met Eliza until she was 10 years old, and at this point, Eliza went to live with her mom and her now new family in Campo Grande. She spent a year there before moving back to her father's home after he threatened both of them with death, then took Eliza back to his terrible home. Life for Eliza was not ideal. Her family was broken. It was in financial strain, and Eliza, since she was very young, was also subjected to abuse by her father. The most disgusting part about Eliza's life with Louise is that when she was just a teenager, he tried to force her into adult work, strictly because of the money that it made. This man had no boundaries, and this alone proved how broken he truly was. The best time of Eliza's life was with her mom, and the year that she spent with her was the only normal and steady time in her life. Nevertheless, her grave family situation did not stop Eliza from aiming for the stars. She wanted to become a model and an actress in the more famous parts of Brazil, like Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. And that's exactly what she did. When Eliza turned 18, she packed her bags and moved to Sao Paulo. But Eliza soon came face to face with the brutal realities of moving to a big city with big dreams and empty pockets. It wasn't going to be easy. Even though Eliza auditioned for a lot of roles in movies, TV shows, and modeling campaigns, she didn't land any of them. Heartbroken and needing money to survive, Eliza felt she had no choice but to turn to adult work unfortunately falling into a terrible trap that so many young women find themselves in, especially in today's world with the advent of apps that let you pay people to do darn near anything. It's so heartbreaking to see Eliza trying to survive in a big city and seeing her dreams fade away so quickly. Eliza may not have had her dream job, but she eventually got a few acting roles, albeit in adult movies. She also fulfilled her modeling dream by featuring in several Brazilian magazines. This was pretty much the gateway to success for Eliza, and it opened up a whole new world of opportunities and connections for her. With her modeling success, Eliza attended various sports events, mainly soccer, and there she met and networked with soccer players who were also celebrities. Eliza had always loved soccer since she was young, and it was her dream to marry a soccer player and become a mom. Well, during one of these events, she did meet someone, and it was a very famous soccer player, Bruno Fernandez de Souza. Bruno came from a broken family too, so he and Eliza had that in common. 
Bruno's dad was a very violent man with a criminal past, and his mom was a raging alcoholic. Needless to say, Bruno and Eliza had pretty rocky starts to their lives. But Bruno made it through and made his life mission to be successful. He became a well-known soccer player, and he played with the Corinthians, then became a partner of MSI before joining Flamengo in 2007. By all accounts, Bruno was a great goalkeeper, and even went on to win several trophies from 2007 to 2009 while playing for Flamengo. But Bruno, at the time of meeting Eliza, was married to a woman named Diane. This was something that Eliza knew about, but it didn't stop both of them from engaging in a full-blown affair. Bruno wasn't looking for anything serious, since he was a famous soccer player and he was obviously already married, but he wasn't opposed to running around behind his wife's back. According to some of Bruno's acquaintances, he had even promised Eliza that he would divorce his wife for her. But we don't know whether what he was saying was true or if he was just trying to pacify Eliza, who definitely wanted something more than a behind-closed-doors fling. Now, Eliza and Bruno's actual place of meeting is unknown. According to some of Bruno's friends, the couple met in 2008 at a barbecue, but according to Bruno, they met at a party. Regardless, the two would spend a lot of nights at Eliza's house away from the press, and a few months into the affair, Eliza fell pregnant with Bruno's baby. Now, Bruno did not take this news well, and he began acting like this was somehow Eliza's fault. But correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure it takes two people to make a baby. It's not like Eliza tricked him into doing anything. It was purely an accident, and regardless, because of the pregnancy, Bruno broke up with Eliza, which is so nauseatingly infuriating. Not only did he completely ditch his responsibilities of being a father, but he happily bummed these responsibilities off onto the child's mother, leaving her to fend for herself when she needed help the most. Bruno, after the breakup, became insistent that he didn't want the baby, claiming Eliza was just a distraction for him and that he wasn't looking for any commitment. He even went as far as to try to force Eliza to get rid of the child, but thankfully Eliza stood her ground and wanted to keep the baby. This proved to be troublesome for Bruno and his reputation because people started to talk. Scandals and rumors were everywhere that Bruno was involved with another woman and that she was expecting their child. This caused Bruno to spiral and then things escalated dangerously. At one point, Bruno kidnapped Eliza and forced her to take medication that would end the baby's life, but thankfully the baby survived with no issues. But this incident caused Eliza to finally come out to the public and file a police report for her safety on October 13th of 2009. In her statement to the police, Eliza said Bruno was a volatile and dangerous man. When the case went to trial, the only protection Eliza got was an order that banned Bruno from coming within 300 meters of her which wasn't nearly enough for Eliza, who was genuinely scared for her life. But the investigators failed to study her case further and give her the protection that she needed. It's believed that since Eliza had previously been involved with adult work, the police more or less wrote her off, gave her a simple restraining order, then sent her on her way. What Eliza really wanted was protection, surveillance, something. After this letdown, Eliza turned to Brazilian news stations and came out with details about her and Bruno's affair, which was a full blow to Bruno's personal life and his reputation. Eliza also demanded financial support from Bruno, but the court turned a blind eye to this, as the couple's relationship wasn't official. Which is completely ridiculous if you ask me. If having a child together doesn't make a relationship official, then I don't know what will. Bruno, in his own press conference and public appearances, went on to state that the child wasn't his and that Eliza was trying to milk money out of him because that was what women in this profession do, according to him. Which really tells you the kind of person that Bruno is. Eliza, on the other hand, shot down these derogatory allegations from Bruno and confirmed she had been faithful to Bruno from the get-go, even though he hadn't technically been faithful to her, though because he was married. The whole situation was just a mess. Fast forward to February 10th of 2010, Eliza gave birth to a healthy baby boy who she named Brunino, which when translated basically means Bruno Jr. or Little Bruno. Bruno was not the least bit interested in his child and didn't even see him until he was four months old. The whole situation was all just so awful for Eliza and the baby. She wanted to give her son a better life. She hoped that the baby's father would show up for him, but sadly, Bruno only cared about his own image and Eliza was about to find out just how far Bruno was willing to go to save his reputation.
Fast forward to June 4th of 2010. This was the last day that Eliza reached out to anyone. It was actually Eliza's mom, Fatima, who found it weird that her daughter hadn't reached out to her in so long. Although Eliza and Fatima initially had a falling out, Fatima was still concerned for her daughter. And get this, Fatima didn't even know Eliza had a child. Eliza's friends were also starting to get worried about Eliza, and no one had heard from her since June 4th. Not long after, 25-year-old Eliza Simudio was reported missing. What was so terrifying was that her baby, Brunino, was nowhere to be found. And this, for police, was a race against time. They immediately opened an investigation, and the news of the Brazilian model was everywhere on the news stations. The detectives looked into various people of interest, and one of them was Bruno. Now, when the investigators questioned Bruno, he vehemently maintained his innocence, saying that he had nothing to do with Eliza's disappearance, the child, and even claimed that he wasn't the father, and that Eliza was just a distraction for him. The same things he kept repeating to the media all those months ago. June 24th, 2010 rolled around, and this is when a shocking and terrifying turn in the case was revealed. See, the police received an anonymous call from a person who stated that Eliza had been tragically murdered, and her body was buried under the concrete floor of Bruno's farm, and that all of the evidence had been burned. Now, even though this was a believable lead, as everyone had a lingering suspicion that the star goalie definitely had something to do with Eliza's disappearance, it wasn't as easy for the police. They couldn't obtain a search warrant for Bruno's residence because he was a prominent figure and the investigation didn't want to rock the boat unnecessarily, which is so hard to wrap your head around. The political climate in this area is apparently just so vastly different from other parts of the world. This is where the police and the justice system failed poor Eliza. Authorities failed to protect her in the beginning for reasons that are so asinine. And now, when Eliza and her son are missing, the investigators cared more about Bruno's public image than a woman who could very much be in danger at that time. If this doesn't make your blood boil, then I don't know what will. But on June 26th, Bruno was officially named the main suspect in Eliza's disappearance, after detectives found Brunino in Bruno's house with one of his other mistresses, Fernanda Castro. Luckily, Brunino was alive, unharmed, and well. When the investigators questioned Fernanda, she confessed that the child had been given to her by Bruno's wife, Diane, and she was asked to keep an eye on him. The detectives were extremely suspicious of Bruno at this point, because why would Diane have Eliza's child, and what was he doing in Bruno's house when he wanted nothing to do with the child? And more importantly, where was Eliza? With this revelation, Fernanda was taken into custody. While on June 28th, another search of Bruno's house was conducted, and by that time, both Bruno and his wife Diane were uncooperative and they'd lawyered up. Pretty convenient timing. Well, the investigators found a lot of disturbing things during their search. Eliza's belongings, including her sunglasses and a pair of black shoes. They also found several baby diapers, and when they searched Bruno's Range Rover, the police found traces of blood, and this was taken in as evidence. When the investigators took all of this evidence to court, though, the judge dropped the case, as the evidence unfortunately wasn't enough. And in all fairness, outside of the blood, which wasn't even proven to be Eliza's at this point, you have to admit the rest of the evidence is fairly circumstantial. I mean, if the two had been dating, it makes sense that a few of her items could have been found at Bruno's home. But on July 6, 2010, though, someone incredibly close to the case contacted the detectives with more evidence than they could have ever asked for. A confession. The man who reached out to investigators was a 17-year-old named Sergio, who was Bruno's cousin. He had some very harrowing details to share with police. According to Sergio, he'd been an accomplice in the murder of Eliza, which was planned by none other than Bruno. According to Sergio, Bruno had reached out to a local hitman and a former police officer named Marcos dos Santos, also known as Bola, and had asked for his help in getting rid of someone who was trying to harm his reputation. Sergio's version of events stated that Bruno was also one of the last people to talk to Eliza on June 4th, when he proceeded to invite her to his farmhouse in Esmeraldas. He apparently wanted to come to an agreement about child support, get a paternity test, and sort out other financial disagreements that the couple had. Since Eliza didn't have a car, Bruno decided that he would pick her up from her place. When a car pulled up in front of Eliza's home, Sergio was in the back seat, while another friend of Bruno's, Luis Enrique Ramal, was driving the car. Eliza unknowingly got into the passenger seat with her baby in her arms, 
and that was tragically when Sergio launched an attack on her. He was armed with a firearm, but Eliza fought to the bitter end, trying to grab the weapon from him. When Sergio tried to fire at Eliza, he found the gun wasn't even loaded, but as a last resort, Sergio hit Eliza on the head with the butt of the firearm until she lost consciousness, and she was then taken to Bruno's house, where he and Bola were waiting for her. Eliza's belongings were taken and burned, and Bruno ordered Bola to, quote, deal with her, but didn't say anything about the child. Bruno then left the scene after paying his henchmen. A day later on June 5th, Bruno had a big game to play with his team, giving him an alibi. Sergio then proceeded to confess that Eliza was held by a local gang for days before her life was ultimately taken, and she was then fed to a group of Rottweilers. After this was done, Brunino was handed over to Bruno, and that was the end of Eliza's story. Now, Sergio's confession, even though it was choppy and kept changing at times, was very much in line with the anonymous call that the investigators had received. It was also believed that whatever was left of poor Eliza was entombed in concrete to remove every trace of her, which was Bruno's intention from the start. According to the evidence that police gathered, Eliza likely lost her life on June 10th, meaning she'd been held by her captors for six days while they did who knows what to her. And this is just a level of tragedy that's just too much. The police, after hearing all of this, decided to conduct another search of the place where Sergio pinpointed where Eliza's remains were, but they found nothing. The detectives believed that Sergio and other men involved in Eliza's tragic passing were lying about the location of her body, as they wanted to get away with as much leniency from the court as possible, which is very rich coming from people who didn't even think twice about driving a defenseless and innocent woman to her tragic end. Sergio's emotional confession proved to be the driving force, and the judge finally issued arrest warrants for everyone involved in Eliza's attack and death, which included Bruno as well. On July 8, 2010, Marcos, better known as Bola, was arrested by the military police. As for Bruno and Louise, they'd surrendered to the police after much convincing by Bruno's lawyers, as this was the best for his public image. Seriously, this man had the nerve to save his reputation, even after what he did. The trial was held on November 19th of 2012, almost two years after the disappearance of Eliza, and the main suspects included Bruno, Louise, Bola, Fernanda, Diane, and the two other accomplices. In the end, Louise was sentenced to only 15 years in prison for abducting and claiming the life of Eliza. Bola received 19 years in prison, an additional three years for hiding Eliza's body. Bruno's mistress, Fernanda, received five years in prison for withholding information from the authorities. For Bruno's trial, Sergio was the star witness, who was found not guilty since he was underage at the time of Eliza's passing. But something drastic did happen. See, Sergio had mysteriously passed away in 2012 after being hit by a motorcycle that had apparently been following him home from work. Even though it's assumed that Bruno didn't have anything to do with Sergio's death, it is a bit mysterious how he died, knowing that Bruno's trial was just around the corner. At Diane's trial, Bruno's wife, Diane was found not guilty and got off completely. In December of 2012, Flamengo officially terminated Bruno's contract, as Bruno's involvement in the team was causing the club to lose sponsors. So in the end, Bruno's reputation was still ruined, meaning at this point, Eliza had lost her life for nothing. Finally, in 2013, Bruno was found guilty of murdering his mistress, Eliza, and he was sentenced to 22 years in prison. But Bruno's story is not over yet, because in 2017, four years after Bruno was imprisoned, an appeal was filed by his attorneys, and Bruno was shockingly set free. Within days of his release, Bruno joined another soccer club called Boa Esporte, for which he played a game on April 8th, 2017, which is just insane. A man who was imprisoned for murder was now out and free to live his life, although this new club also lost all of its sponsors after Bruno joined, and there was a huge display of disgust from the public directed towards Boa Esporte for taking a convicted criminal in the club. But that wasn't for long because Bruno was rearrested after his appeal was rejected and he had to live out his full sentence, meaning his contract with the new club was also terminated. But this was also short-lived because in July of 2019, Bruno was given a semi-open prison sentence in which he was allowed out of prison during the day but was locked behind bars during the night, which is downright absurd. 
It's so baffling to see that the court is willing to treat Bruno, a convicted murderer, with so much leniency just because he's famous. Yet the system completely failed to give Eliza protection, a single mother who was just trying her best to move on with her life. Later on, Bruno went on to join another soccer club, but his contract was yet again terminated because he couldn't make it to practice and training sessions because of his prison restrictions. Bruno eventually divorced his wife and went on to marry someone else in prison. So by all accounts, Bruno was living a pretty normal life. He's still serving his semi-open prison sentence, and he currently has another family and is looking for another soccer club to join. Soon after Eliza's disappearance and during the trial, her mom Fatima fought to the death for Bernino's custody. Again, when you think things couldn't get worse, the Brazilian justice system proves you wrong. And this time, the court failed to see reason yet again. The baby's custody was given to none other than his grandfather, Luis Carlos Samudio, the same person who abused Eliza and Fatima and even forced his own daughter to engage in adult work at a very young age. Who in their right mind would grant custody of a child to a predator who doesn't even have a credible record of taking care of his own family? Well, according to the court, Luis Carlos was the last person Eliza was living with, so it was only reasonable that her child lived with him too. But they failed to mention that it was Luis holding Eliza captive, since he threatened her to death if she left. Fatima, after Bruno's custody was handed over, went straight to the court and demanded custody of the child and gave rock solid proof of Louise's violent behavior. Not long after, a conviction came out, holding Louise accountable for assaulting a 10 year old girl. And this was when the court immediately took custody away from Louise and Fatima was granted full custody of Brunino. Fatima officially became the baby's legal guardian. She requested a paternity test, which proved that Brunino was indeed Bruno's child. This confirmed Eliza's claim that she'd been faithful to Bruno. The child has grown up since and is living with his grandmother, who's showering him with all the attention and love that Eliza would have if she'd been alive and well. This case is truly tragic and is a perfect display of raw and unfiltered human rage. To think that Bruno, a self-obsessed and fame-hungry excuse of a person, would remove Eliza from the picture so brutally and mercilessly and then witness the court go above and beyond in leniency towards him is chilling beyond measure. Eliza, who had a rough start in life, was a headstrong girl with dreams of starting a family with the man that she loved. But she paid with her life, which was snuffed out by the very man she thought she could trust. Controlling and abusive relationships are like a dark maze with seemingly no way out. But there definitely is one if you choose to change the course of your life. We all deserve someone who's proud to have us in their life, not hide us away, because that's what real and healthy relationships are made of. And I think we all deserve that. Sadly, that chance was stolen away from Eliza, but don't let it be stolen away from you too. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. I wanted to give a special thank you to a couple channel members, including Hillary Wallace and Charlotte McDonald. If you also want to become a member of the channel, you'll gain access to new videos sometimes days or weeks before they're uploaded to the public. And it's currently the best way you can help support the channel. I really appreciate those of you that have decided to do that. And if you want to join, you can click that big join button below the video or find the link down in the description. But as always, if you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered and don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. But my name is Ty Knotts and I'll catch you guys in the next one.